Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, latest installment of the Institute of Politics Exploration of America in the Trump Era. Tonight we're going to take on what is perhaps the most hotly debated uh, issue of, the, of this period, which is uh, health care. And uh, as you will hear, we have as good a panel as one could assemble uh, to discuss uh, this issue with Nancy Ann uh, DeParle, who was an architect of the Affordable Care Act, and Governor Mike Levitt, former Secretary of Health and Human Services. And we have a, a, uh, an, a great uh, introducer who will fill in uh, some of those details. Uh, next week, next Thursday, right here, we'll have a discussion uh, led by Robert Costa of the Washington Post on the future of the Republican Party, and then on the 27th of uh, February, we'll have a discussion on the future of the Democratic Party with leading uh, Republican and Democratic uh, politicians. Uh, and you can find out, uh, additional information about upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. As always, after our moderated discussion, we'll be taking questions from the audience. And as always, we're going to demand that they be questions. Uh, and we'll prioritize We'll prioritize uh, students for the first uh, three questions. Um, so please keep, keep your questions short and uh, to the point and end them in a question mark. Uh, silence your cell phones. And now uh, to formally uh, introduce our guests is Alessandro Clark Ansani. Uh, Ale is a second year in the college studying political science and public policy and serves as the fellows intern at the Institute of Politics. Ale. Good evening, everyone, and a welcome to America in the Trump Era, the Future of Healthcare. President Obama campaigned and governed on the idea of making health care more affordable and more accessible to everyday Americans. While conservatives and liberals alike can agree that the Affordable Health Care Act was not perfect, as few legislation and policies are, it is a fact that today many Americans who were previously uninsured have coverage. However, President Trump and many other Republican politicians have vowed to repeal and replace this legislation, but have yet to offer the new legislation in writing. Tonight, we are joined by former Governor of Utah and former U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Michael Levitt, and former Director of the White House Office of Health Reform, Nancy Ann DeParle, two individuals who have had extensive exposure and experience with government-provided health care. Governor Levitt served under President George W. Bush and was involved with attempts to improve Medicare and Medicaid, particularly in regards to prescription drugs. Dr. DeParle served in the Obama administration, helping to lead the administration's health care reform, including the passing of the Affordable Health Care Act. We are also joined by visiting fellow Jackie Combs, a former New York Times journalist who covered the White House during the first five years of the Obama administration. As elected officials weigh the options regarding the future of health care, hopefully these guests can help shed some light on possible outcomes. Please join me in a warm round of applause in welcoming our speakers. Cheers. Yes, they are. <laughs> I have that Roseanne, Rosanna Dana feeling. Yeah. Good evening. Thanks for so many people being here. Um, I'm going to start tonight with sort of a vent, the perspective of a um, politics and policy reporter long standing, and uh, the frustration journalists like me would have over the years um, at having to quote. Uh, politicians who'd say something, uh, promise something they knew couldn't be done and, um, and wouldn't be done. And yet, uh, you could never write that in so many words. You couldn't make that judgment in a news, news uh, story. And the best example of what I'm talking about for the past seven years has been the promise to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And uh, yes, there are some members of Congress who were sincere in wanting to repeal it and thinking that was possible without huge disruption to industries and to, to people. 
And, um, but a lot of them knew better, frankly. And um, it's now that they're in full control in Washington, the repeal and replace dogs have sort of like the dogs that caught the car and they don't know what to do. And the consternation's been clear for the last few weeks. In, um, I just want to give you one example before I turn to questions. On January 10th, President Trump, well, this was before he was president, told the New York Times that he wanted a repeal vote next week, quote unquote, and replacement, quote unquote, simultaneously. <laughs> and he didn't have a replacement then, and neither does Congress. Uh, Congress did vote to start the repeal process without an alternative. And that legislation, which didn't need his signature, directed the committees to write a replacement by January 27th. <laughs> yeah, it's February 8th. Um, so in recent days, President Trump told Bill O'Reilly that something would qu come, quote, by the end of the year, at least the rudiments, unquote. Now, few people in the country know more than these two people about um, health care policy and the difficulty of making it and implementing it. So I'm going to turn first to Governor Levitt because you're of the party that's in power and ask you to tell me, tell us how this is going to play out and how it's going to end. <laughs> Just a small, quick question. So as you were asking the, uh, your, in your earlier comment, my mind was carried uh, back to a moment in time when it was uh, 2012, and we were engaged in a campaign for president. President Obama was the incumbent, and Mitt Romney was the challenger. And in April of that year, he called me on the phone and said, uh, we need to have some thoughts about what we're going to do after, in terms of planning, would you chair the transition for what we hoped would be the Romney administration? And I agreed. Um, one of the first things we did was to make a list of all of the commitments that had been made by candidate Romney with the idea that there would be an obligation to actually do those things. And one of those commitments was that we will repeal and replace uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And so we actually formed a quite elaborate process of planning this transition. We took it very seriously. And uh, one of the questions that was posed very early is, what does it mean to repeal and replace Obamacare? Well, it, it, it became evident to me, and I'm sure it was to most of the rest of the world, you can't pretend that a law didn't exist for a period of time. But that this phrase, repeal and replace, is essentially a big principle that means a lot of things to a lot of people, and the literal removal of the law like it didn't exist isn't one of those. Now, I will tell you that the decision that I made uh, was there would be a moment in time when there was, at that point, probably a reasonable thing to have a bill that said it would be repealed, but it would fail because we would likely have a divided government. And at that point, we then had to go through a process where we would define what the word repeal meant and we would re define what the word, uh, the, the, what the word replace meant. Now, the circumstance they find themselves in today is not measurably different than that. And what we're seeing them go through is a process that I think is not substantially different than that. The one thing you can be certain of is that at some point in time, there will be a bill that will pass Congress. And the title of that bill will be <laughs> Repeal and Replace. Because they have dined out on that phrase for six years they have been rewarded in three subsequent elections for that phrase, and they have an obligation to fulfill it. Now, some people may have in their mind a list this long when it comes to the things that will be repealed. The likelihood is it'll be shorter than that. <laughs> There's a long list of people, of the things that people will believe should be replaced, and the likelihood is the list will be shorter than that. In the context of history, when we try to ground truth what is happening now and in the last decade or two, it's very important not to think of healthcare transformation as being about the Obama years or the Trump years. 
we have to acknowledge that this is a 40-year process, and we're about 25 years into it. And what we're seeing is iterations in history. Now, we will see changes occur to the Affordable Care Act. And I think you have to give credit to, the, uh, to President Obama that he passed something. And it got change started in a way that it hadn't before. But frankly, there are things that need to change with the Affordable Care Act and that needs to iterate. And in this really ham-handed thing we call our democracy, this is the way we do things. And we'll begin to iterate. And over time, it will continue to change. But you have to look at this in a longer time frame than just a narrow period of time compared to another narrow period of time. So Nancy, what do you, I mean, how do you see this ending from your vantage? Well, the first part of my friend Governor Levitt's answer made me feel like Alice in Wonderland a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I do think you're probably right. They, the, uh, the Republican, Republicans in Congress and President Trump have gotten themselves um, into a, a corner here where they have to pass something that they say is a repeal. Um, I do worry, though, that having that conversation is um, having the opposite effect on, that they say they want on, on the markets and on, uh, on our healthcare system. Um, they say they want everyone to be covered and beautifully covered, as President Trump puts it, and lower costs and the, you know, the, the, this ideal world. And as you say, Governor, there certainly are changes that could be made to the Affordable Care Act. You and I have spent time talking about them, and I had a list a mile long right after the bill passed of things that I would do and what you would typically do, Jackie, you've been around these processes, you typically, after you pass a major piece of legislation, um, you have uh, a technicals law. When right. we did the Balanced Budget Act in the 90s, we then came back with the Balanced Budget, um, uh, BBRA, the Balanced Budget something Repair Act. Then we did the, uh, um, the BIPA, the, the yeah. Budget Improvement Act. So there's things you do to, to right fix the unintended consequences no, you're to right. strengthen Every, some Throughout pieces. my career, I can go back to the 1986 Tax Reform Act of Ronald Reagan, and there were, there were several technical corrections uh, legislation, because whenever you have big comprehensive legislation, everybody right. assumes there will be fixes to make. And the Medicare prescription drug benefit uh, law that was passed in 2003, there were technical corrections to that, weren't there, Governor? Oh, yes, a lot of them, and a lot were needed. Yeah, yes. and there, I don't think and there's anyone with it. that but, would disagree that um, ACA didn't right. Need. So I just think um, my only disagreement. I it seems a little surreal that they have to go through this process of calling something repeal when when you actually look at the pieces of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it was based on you know by many years of bipartisan right. work uh, to come up with what is a uniquely American way of solving these problems of of uh, cost of health care being out of control, of trying to get everyone covered, of dealing with pre-existing condition exclusions and all the insurance market um, dysfunction out there. And we did it in a way that, for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, was um, you know, ba built on the foundation that we had and, and was bipartisan. And so um, I was looking earlier at the, the, the Final Senate bill had 167 Republican amendments in it. Mm -hmm. So there should have been a basis there to just take that and let's sit down and figure out how to repair this. Um, Senator Patty Murray said something recently that uh, really I thought was evocative about it, which is it's sort of hard to repair the roof when they're burning the house down underneath. Right. And that's right. kind of how this feels. Um, and I don't think it's really necessary. And what worries me is, the number of people calling the um, marketplaces, uh, asking, should I still sign up for this? You know, that's going to discourage. The thing that needs to happen right now, and Governor Levitt uh, has some very specific ideas that I think are the right ones on how to strengthen the marketplaces. That's what needs to happen. We need to make sure that, they're, that the younger, healthier people are enrolling um, so that they work, so that insurers will feel like they can make a profit there and we'll come in and there's things like that that need to happen. And the actions of an executive order which suggests that maybe the law won't be enforced and removing the 
frankly, relatively paltry sum left of you know, several million dollars to do the marketing and enrollment mm -hmm. in the last two weeks of the, of the enrollment period. Those aren't the things you do when you want to yeah. strengthen this, stabilize it, and then move forward. So that's what worries me. Could, could I just make a yeah. point that, I mean, this is politics. Uh, and, and, and it can't be logically rationalized. Um, ca campaigns, I mean, I, one of the things that was very important for me to learn is that you can explain Washington with really two things. One is that it's all about preparing for the next election uh, and it's control of the news cycle. And campaigns are run with big themes. And sometimes those themes expand way beyond the scope of whatever that theme is. I mean, one of the famous ones is a chicken in every pot. What does that mean? Well, it became a rallying cry over a lot of different things. And that's what repeal and replace became. It is not about health care alone. It's about control of the government. And it's a symbol of what people want the government to look like and feel like, and it was a way of rejecting. It became a big symbol that people were arguing over. And, and so... So if it became Levitt Care in Utah or in Kentucky, Romney it care. was Kentucky Care, you know, K-Care, Romney Care. That is more popular generally with people than thinking it's a federal government solution. But I, that's, I think that's part of what's here. I mean, I think what people were rejecting wasn't just the Affordable Care Act. It was a dysfunctional government, and the Republicans made a symbol out of the Affordable Care Act that said, this is dysfunctional, and I want government that works. And that's why it became an overall broad theme that they drove. Now, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that's the way I think you have to right. see this debate. And so, yes, they, they now have to reconcile to their broad theme. And the logical way for them to do it is to do as much of that, to get the list as long as they can on repeal and as long as they can on replace. But the reality is, when it gets down to coming up with 435 votes and 51 votes or 60, the list is going to be smaller than that. And they, well, will, the they will, with a good conscience, say we did the best we can to repeal and replace. But it was a much bigger theme for them than just health care. Well, we could get into a long discussion about how much of the dysfunction is a, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, by the you know, opposition and obstruction to, to the plan and then implementing it because I have to think you have some sympathy having tried to put through the Medicare prescription drug, you know, stand that up from ground zero. And the idea of doing that with um, people through the whole time trying to kill it would be would be daunting, wouldn't it? This, this was a fascinating personal experience for me. Now, <laughs> what she's relating is that I was responsible to bring 43 million people a new prescription drug benefit. Not just people, seniors. Seniors, See, That's Thank even you. harder, <laughs> right? I mean, Very special politics. people of which I am now yeah, right. among. <laughs> um, and and the, during the first 12 weeks or so, it was a mess. We had people lining up at their pharmacies and they couldn't get their drugs. Uh, this is a long story, except that during that 13 or 12 weeks, the, a whole series of attacks were made on that program and they needed to roll it back and we needed to stop and blah, 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 blah. Then roll forward to the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. Exactly the same arguments are being made against it. My point is that these things, these arguments are made and the same arguments tend to, they'll just flip because it's all about the next election and control of the news cycle. And so, so I don't think you can, uh, again, I'm not defending this, mm -hmm. but it's a very real factor uh, right. in the way politics works because it's not just about health care. It's about big, broad themes that lead to control of the government which can then extend into lots of different places. And so any campaign tends to look for the big, broad themes, and they drive them. Let me go to a question that I wasn't sure I was going to ask, but Nancy, you talked about how to strengthen the marketplaces, and it, to, we need more um, healthy people to attract more healthy and young people to whose you know, insurance premiums will offset the cost of serving the sicker people. 
And the key to that is the individual mandate. Now, that is the core of the ACA that the Republicans have most objected to, I think. And I don't know if that'll make your short list of what will be there in the end. I assume it won't be there, but then the question is, what's there instead? But I want, I want to um, go back. When the, in the years you were governor of Utah was the years that um, President Clinton and Hillary Clinton were trying to pass their health care law. Mm -hmm. and, at that, and I was covering Congress at that point for the Wall Street Journal. And the um, Democrats were trying, the plan called for an employer mandate, that it was, mm -hmm. employers were mandated to cover their employees. The Republican alternative in the Senate, led by um, Robert Dole, was to an individual mandate for individual responsibility. And I'm just curious, because I honestly don't know the answer to this question is, how could you just, I mean, briefly, uh, okay. tell me, when did Republicans move from that idea of individual responsibility slash individual mandate to opposing it? Well, look, look, there's a lot of, I used an example just a moment ago of a lot of times when people begin to just change their arguments, change from one party to the next. Mm -hmm. And it's typically because they're against it now when they might have been for it. When it was, I mean, I'll give you a really good example that I think is current. For many years, over the last six years, the Republicans have argued about a part of the Affordable Care Act called the Center for CMMI, Center for Medicaid Medicare Innovation. Innovation. And it was a very broad extension of authority to the Secretary of Health to be able to essentially write the law the way they wanted to in specific situations to innovate. The Republicans hated it. They hated that much authority being in the hands of an unelected person who would move the, the, the system in a way that was not consistent with their ideology. We have an election. And now there's something different about it, and that is who actually holds that pen. Now it's a very attractive authority, and the Democrats are attacking it, and the Republicans are defending it. And now it isn't on the list to be repealed. And it's not on the list to be repealed. Yeah. It's funny. Funny now, about that. Exchanges is another example. David and I were talking about this earlier. If you go back on the history of exchanges, this is, it, 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 you can go back to 92 with the Clinton. You were doing it. And the, what the, I remember. The, well, the, the, the Clinton administration proposed something that looked a lot like an exchange. They called them co-ops. You go forward about 10, and by the way, the Republicans hated it, and they killed it. 10 years later, the Republicans came up with a similar idea, actually came out of the Heritage Foundation called exchanges. <laughs> and the Democrats hated that. Yes, they did. Then you go forward another five or six years, and we have an election, and they have now the, the writers of the ACA did a very clever thing. They took the exchange that looked a lot like Hillary Clinton had, and they took the name of the exchanges that the Heritage Found came, Foundation came up with and called them exchanges. And now the Republicans hated that. So they had a big fight and ended up basically saying every state can decide which they want, one like the, Repub like, like the Clinton administration wanted or one like the Heritage Foundation. My point is that there, if you're looking for consistency here, <laughs> it, it, it will be hard to find. The hobgoblin of little minds. Um, I want a question for uh, both of you. And uh, the first, Governor Levitt, to the differences that Republicans have among themselves as they undertake this effort. President Trump and some of his closest advisors have talked about the goal is universal coverage. The Republicans are saying universal access to affordable coverage. Those are two very different things. How are they going to bridge that? Can they bridge that? Well, I think we ought to start by acknowledging that, that there is a widely held American aspiration for everyone to have access to affordable insurance. That does not divide us. What does divide us is exactly how to get it done, how to define it, what to call it, and words matter a lot here. But I think it's a very important point that Republicans and Democrats do not disagree on whether that's a, a, a laudable national goal. How will they achieve it? I, I, you know, I, I think I could, and, and Nancy Ann could lay out pathways where they could achieve it. But we also need to remember that none of this happens in isolation. Uh, 
Donald Trump's only commitment was not re repeal and replace. He committed to a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment. He committed to uh, have to rebuild the military. Uh, Republicans in the Congress are going to feel very strongly about not having the national debt become substantially higher. And so all of these things have to take place in the context of the other. Mm -hmm. And so there are natural limits. And the, and the reality is they, you know, if you were to ask how that's going to be defined, it would, they'd probably put a horizon on it mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. uh, th that's our aspiration. We're passing the Universal Care Act or the Universal Access Act, and we hope to have it within 12 years. Uh, and they declare victory. That, that suggests a, uh, a question that both of you can address. Um, in terms of paying for whatever it is that the Republicans come up with on health care, a health care alternative, I mean, it is going to cost something. And there is some talk among some Republicans, I think they're a minority at this point, about keeping the taxes that are in the Affordable Care Act um, that Republicans have opposed up to now. The taxes range from those on um, Medi medical, uh, medical device devices. taxes in hospitals and uh, on wealthy people and on uh, people who, uh, the penalties for people who don't buy insurance. Um, all those sources of revenue, uh, there's now talk of keeping them to help finance whatever it is Republicans come up with. Given their concern about deficits and debt, do you think, do you both, either of you see some of those things in the new law? Well, I do only because, as, as the governor said, um, the Republicans felt, and President Obama told us, and the Congress uh, felt, we have to pay for this. In fact, we actually reduced the deficit over, um, the numbers I just saw, $2.6 trillion over the ten, ten first 10 years of the, of the Affordable Care Act. So that will be a tough um, hurdle, I think. Mm -hmm. They won't, I believe, I believe that the Republicans in Congress are committed to not increasing the deficit, and it'll be really hard to do anything here without, you know, by, by getting rid of those taxes. So there's no other real way to fund this unless they want to do more Medicare cuts. We did things almost exclusively from the health care system. I suppose you could put a tax on something else, but I doubt that would be popular. So l let's go to some specific things and, and answer right, your question right. in the context of that. Uh, Nancy and I, Ann and I would agree that the individual insurance market in our country is very fragile right now. Uh, it could easily and has begun to erode in a way that the 20 million people who have insurance through the exchanges and otherwise um, are in danger. The insurance companies have said we're losing so much money that we can't justify to the nonprofit organizations that we oversee continuing to do this. And the reason for that is because there's a very serious set of flaws in the Affordable Care Act that could be and should be fixed, and nearly everyone agrees that they need to be fixed. We now have a different problem, and that is that the Republicans own this problem now because they have the power to fix it. And they've made a commitment that they're not going to let 20 million people hang out without it, or be left hanging. So they, they, they have to fix this. But the reality is the fix will not happen immediately. It will take two to three years for that fix to implement. And if they're going, even if, they're, if they replace it with something brilliant, it will take yeah. three to even four years for that to today, happen. It would take some time to redo it. So right? they have to pay for these 20 million people and the subsidies that are there for that period of time. Now we're back to the trillion dollars of infrastructure, the rebuilding the military, not busting the budget and having things that Republicans feel strongly about. They're going to suffer if they let 20 million people. So the, the pressures of all of this dictate only one possible outcome. And that is they're going to pass whatever they do is to replace. They're going to defer it for a period of time. They're going to keep the status quo in place while they do, and they're going to have to pay for that, probably by deferring any tax increases, or I'm sorry, tax okay. reductions that they have committed to do. But they'll still be able to claim victory because they will put it in place. Now, right. we'll see where it goes well, three or four years from now, but. 
And right, tax reform right. is one thing that wasn't on your list, but that I hear is a very high priority for um, the tax, tax reform, reform. Yes, in general. It is. So uh, if, if Leader McConnell wants to do tax reform, uh, that also figures into this mix. Right, right. Um, so what is the, I mean, it, can either of you see what is the alternative? Uh, the, up to now, the Republicans have talked about, mainly about the ideas that insurance companies should be able to sell across state lines, number one. Um, and number two, that people should open health savings accounts that would be a tax-favored account that would allow them to buy their own coverage on the private markets. Neither one of those, the, together, those things don't, have never added up to covering the same people that are covered by ACA, especially, and you know, leaves out the whole question of Medicaid, which roughly covers, I think, isn't it about half or right. a little over half right. of those 20 some millions who are newly insured thanks to the ACA. But so is, as an alternative, how does that state, you know, selling insurance across state lines and HSAs stack up? Well, I don't think it stacks up very well. Um, Selling insurance across state lines is an idea that's been around for a while. It actually is something that we put in the Affordable Care Act. States can do that, insurance companies can do that. But uh, the states have to agree. So this is a, a case where we said, if the state of Utah um, and the state of Illinois wanna say we're gonna let insurers sell from Illinois to Utah and Utah back, they have to agree so that both insurance commissioners know that it's gonna happen. Um, this is an, an area where the uh, insurance commissioners around the country, Republican and Democrat, agree that it, it's not a good idea because right. they think there will be a, a race to the bottom that the standards, um, all the insurers will wanna go to the state with the lowest standards where it's easiest to take advantage of consumers, design products there and sell them in other states. So. They at least don't think it should be something that's widespread, you know. But if someone wants to try it, I'm I'm okay with seeing if it works. I don't think it's a solution to this problem. Nor do I think that um, HSAs, which are fine, I have one. A lot of people have them. They tend to work better for higher income people uh, because the money accumulates in there, and and you can uh, you're less likely to to fail to go get health care because of not having enough money in your account. So those could be expanded, but I don't think they're the right, I don't think they're the answer for the population of people who really need help here. So I did not come tonight uh, to advocate a plan. Uh, what I am here to do is to do my best to say through the filter of my mind and eyes, based on what I have seen and experienced over all of these many years, uh -huh. how do I think this is ultimately going to, sh uh, mm -hmm. to um, through the shifting sands of of politics going to turn out. And, and here's the way I think this issue works out. I think the first thing they have to do is they have to fix the fragile nature of the individual market, or this big problem is going to become theirs. And they will go in and repair some things in the Affordable Care Act that will allow insurance companies a rational reason to stay in the individual market. Okay, that's, that's an important... Can you do that without an individual mandate? Uh, so they'll then have to wrestle with that. But let's say this, we are now about, um, I guess, six years into this, mm -hmm. and the individual mandate has really never been enforced. Right. And so a lot of people will argue, you've got an individual mandate, but that's not what's holding this together. They, they will likely re re repeal the, in, the individual mandate, but they'll replace it with something, ultimately, and there's a lot of ways they could do, they could do the same thing we do with Medicare. They could say, when you turn 26 and leave your parents' policy, uh, you need to buy insurance. Choose if you will or choose if you won't. But if you don't, just like on Medicare, if you don't sign up for Medicare, your Medicare gets 1% a year more expensive every year. You seniors in this, in this audience know that that's the case. And the reason for that is if you put it off, you haven't been paying your fair share. So some people could say, let's just add 1% a year and you can decide, but it's gonna become more expensive for the day when you want. So they could replace it with something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think they're going to likely change the way the subsidies are organized and the amount that are available. Uh, right now it's done through basically a government check of, uh, 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 based on your income. They will want to change it to a tax credit 
Uh, we could have a lengthy conversation about why that's different, but uh, basically it just changes the way the subsidies. Now, by the way, it's going to take probably two and a half to three years for the IRS to be able to do that. And so if they choose to do that, they're going to have to keep the existing plan in place and pay the subsidies, and that's why they're going to have to pay for it. So that's where I think the individual insurance thing plays out. They may allow insurance to be sold across state lines. That would be a really interesting experiment. I agree it's not in and of itself the solution. Then you have to get to Medicaid, and that's probably on your list. Right. But they have to deal with, the, with, with Medicaid as, as part of this. And there are other sections. But I, in terms of what you were raising, I think that's the way this ultimately shifts out. They, 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 they do something to repeal it. They give themselves three to four years for that to occur. They, play, they pass a series of bills that will replace it, mm -hmm. but they give themselves three or four years for it to happen. They probably scale back the amount of the subsidies, and they change the way it happens. But the system will essentially be, uh, will continue to work through exchanges and through employers uh, going forward. So do, are you saying they would scale back both the, the cost sharing subsidies and the tax credits? Because they all use the refundable advanceable tax credits just like we have in the Affordable Care but there's Act. A, but there's a, the question isn't the vehicle, it's the amount that they'll allow to go out. Okay. So They think they're too generous. Uh, they, think they're, they'll, they think, look, I think this is a great place to bring something up. This isn't being driven by politics. <laughs> this is being driven by global economic forces that are requiring the United States to deal with the fact that we have a $20 trillion deficit. Mm -hmm. And that at some point, we're going to have to deal with it. And so I, ultimately, these budget issues are going to come back. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you cannot continue to do it the same way because the world will punish us not with the military, but with their economics. And so they are worried, mm -hmm. and rationally so, that if you just have everything un uh, unlimited, they've got to find some limits. And I think they'll say, look, let's continue to give these credits, but instead of having this many, let's kind of allow this many. And instead of subsidizing this many people, let's subsidize this many people. And that'll be the debate. I'm about to turn it over to all of you, but I wanted to ask quickly, I wanted to turn it to Democrats before I do, and ask you, Nancy, and, and Governor, I know, well, and let me interject there, I don't call, that I call her Nancy and him Governor is not a sign of disrespect. I've known Nancy for a long time, and her husband worked for the uh, New York Times as well, so. And when and you've been I, Governor, Governor, like it's governor. like a nickname, yeah. you know, it isn't, <laughs> don't think of it as respect, it's just a nickname. <laughs> So, and, and I know you talk to some de Democrats because you're that kind of a Republican. Um, but what, what's the, what do the Democrats do here? Do they just sit back and watch the Republicans in their misery of their legislative <laughs> process? And just, or do they try to have a positive impact in shaping the ultimate outcome? Well, um, I don't have any inside knowledge into to the Democratic caucus and what they're planning, but I, you know, I think they're um, very concerned about stabilizing the marketplaces, and I think uh, they know from experience that that uh, getting 50 votes, everyone says, oh, they don't have to get 60 to repeal; it's only 50. Well, getting 50 votes isn't that easy. It wouldn't be easy to get 50 votes in the Democratic caucus when we had 58 votes. It's not that easy to get 50 votes. So I. I would. I don't like the image of them, um, you know, standing there as a group watching uh, Republican colleagues twist in the wind. But I think that I don't think they're going to help. I don't think they're going to help with repeal. I don't. No, and I wouldn't expect them to help with repeal. But if it's done in a way that, well, I guess they have to re repeal if they're keeping their word. What do you think? Well, they're going to do exactly what the Republicans did. They're going to start looking to the next election, and they're going to come up with the best things they can that will position them to try and improve their position two years from now. And just like there were a bunch of Republicans who would have liked to have found a way to refine the Affordable Care Act and participated in the debate, they're probably not going to. Um, maybe it'll be a bit different. I hope it is, because I think there's a chance here if we begin to look at this as a refinement and and making the big changes that need to be made. But mm -hmm. the cha you know, history says 
they will, they will do what the Republicans did, which is start preparing for the next election and trying to control the news cycle. Yeah. Well, as you all are clearly aware, you come to the middle aisle to ask your questions. The first three, I hope the first three people are students and make sure there's a question mark at the end of your statement. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt Enloe, and I'm a second year student at the law school. Some hospitals have just begun implementation of some programs funded by Affordable Care Act incentives. An obvious, obvious effect of the repeal will be consumer price increases, but surely there will be other unintended consequences. How would you expect the cost that Trump is imposing to be distributed, both between individuals and institutions, and what other effects do you predict from the fallout? Well, one, one thing, one thing that uh, the governor alluded to is uh, this isn't all happening in a vacuum. And we're talking about a $4 trillion industry here. So hospitals, all the other providers, doctors, um, they're at the table right now demanding that if there is a repeal and a replace, and the hospitals broadly supported health reform because they saw people coming to the hospital without coverage and they wanted to have coverage. If there is a repeal, uh, they, the, the Congress must replace the funding that they contributed towards paying for all this. And so that's just another problem on the problem list that uh, we've been talking about. How will they do that? How can they give the money back to the hospitals? The hospitals argue that if there's no longer a plan to cover everyone, then we need our money back for covering the uninsured and covering the disproportionate share of low-income people who come to our hospitals. And I think they have a strong argument. So um, I, I don't know how it'll be distributed, but I think uh, I would be very surprised if they pass some repeal or bill without giving that money back. And it, there's more where that came from. So most of that money is coming from newly insured people. And um, as we talked earlier, I think there's a widely held aspiration in both parties for there to continue to be access to affordable insurance. Uh, we've already had the conversation about, at least my view, that they've made a commitment that they're not going to let 20 million people uh, um, find themselves in, uh, without insurance. It, they would pay a heavy political price. They've made a commitment they're not going to do that. I've already suggested I think the way they're ultimately going to pay for it is by delaying a lot of the income events. So I would argue that perhaps the premise that we're going to see hospitals dramatically reduce is a, 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 is a process of, I mean, it, it, this happens after most elections. Uh, when there's a big change in power, it's like a nuclear event occurs. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the best place when a nuclear event happens is to lay in a ditch. Mm -hmm. Be, and let, let the blast go over the top of you and then look out and see what's gonna happen. We're still a bit in the blast phase where everybody is, is talking about their worst fears and talking about the events that will occur at the extreme. And I don't think that any of that's going to occur. I think there's enough forces here that are going to keep rational minds, if, if for no other reason, just because of their political instincts, uh, that we, we will likely not see dramatic reductions in hospital funding. Thank you. So uh, Governor Levitt, uh, what you talked earlier about how we're in the middle of a 40-year process in reforming our health care. And I, I was really impressed to, to hear you say that because normally you don't hear politicians talk about things taking a long view like that. Like you normally hear about, you know, this is the one right here. And, uh, how, um, how many, who else, who else thinks like that? Who, who can we look to? Who can we look to who's in office right now who uh, is also trying to take that approach? Because sometimes it seems like people are just going, as you said, from election cycle to election cycle. I think there are people in, in, on, in both parties who think that way. But they are in a system that requires accountability in two or six year segments uh, or four year segments. And so it's, it, the system militates a bit against that. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I think it is, it is necessary to view this properly, to step back. It's like Google Earth. If you could just push that button and go out and see these problems and then go back down at the street level where you have to fix them, being able to come out and see it makes a big difference. And you know, at some point, we don't have time tonight, but reconciling that 40 years makes a lot of sense. And frankly, it begins to dictate a lot of what you do to fix it. I think this question is mostly at the governor, but 
um, anyone can respond. Uh, I'm wondering with the upcoming congressional recess, a lot of democratic activists and organizers are talking about putting a lot of pressure on um, uh, town hall meetings with representatives and uh, really like, um, you know, pushing the representatives to change their, Republicans to change their stance. Already there are Republicans talking about saying repair instead of repeal and replace, and there seems to be some uh, fissures there. So I was just wondering if you could comment on um, whether or not you think that these types of efforts will have any impact. If you just lost an election as profoundly as the Democrat Party did, the smart thing to do is to look, again, in history and say, who else experienced this and what did they do and how did it turn out? Well, it's very easy to look back to 2008 and 2010 and to see what the Republicans did uh, in 2010. They invented the repeal and replace phrase and they went to town meetings and they incited their base and they got right in the face and, and now and that's exactly what the Democrat Party is organizing. So the roles have just replaced, the arguments just remain the same. And it's, it's part of the way this, the political process works. And uh, it's, it's, you know, there's a certain um, elegance in it and a certain <laughs> lack of elegance in it at the same time and we, we all get that. Hi, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, Mr. Parle, you, early on you used the phrase a uniquely American solution, um, which is a phrase that's often used in reference to the solutions, market-based solutions, um, like the ACA. Um, but I'm wondering about Medicare, which is a program more beloved by Americans than I think any other government program um, currently in place, um, which is not a market-based program, and yet is, has been working. I'm talking about traditional Medicare now, not the, the newfangled. Not Medicare Med Advantage. Right, not the Advantage programs. Um, it's operated for many years just fine without the insurance companies being involved. Um, and I'm wondering if that is not also an American solution and why that can't be extended to everyone. Well, it, Medicare is a great American program and I, I was privileged to lead it for a uh, number of years and uh, Governor mm -hmm. Levitt also has the title of secretary because he, he led it as well. Um, and the Medicare Advantage part of it is growing by the way, so the private, the choice of private plans part of Medicare is growing. Um, I do think though that it's, it's different in that, you know, Medicare was set up to deal with a problem where there were no, there was really nothing for seniors at that time. Seniors in this country didn't have access to anything. Whereas what we were trying to do was hopefully get bipartisan support for a program that would um, build on what we already had. We didn't want to disrupt employer arrangements. We didn't want to disrupt the market that already existed. We just wanted to strengthen it, make it work better, get rid of some of the abuses, the pre-existing condition exclusions and the things that, um, the limits, annual limits. So we were trying to work to you know, repair the existing system. Um, as you'll recall, uh, President Obama supported a public plan operating alongside these private plans. We didn't have the votes even in the Democratic caucus at that time for such a plan. I think today that we might. Uh, so, you know, you will see if after, after the next uh, two-year election cycle whether things look a little bit different. But, but uh, there wasn't the support for doing something like Medicare for all or um, a single payer system back in 2009 and 2010. Again, you know, it's, as the governor says, a, a 40 year process. So maybe we'll see if there is one later. I'm working on it. <laughs> Could I just come make a brief comment on this? Because I think the, you, 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 with this conversation on health care can be boiled down really to one question. And that is, what role do you want government to play in your life? And healthcare becomes a huge symbol. And, and Medicare for everyone plays out as we're going to have the government heavily involved in our health care. Can I respond to that? Well, I, I'm, I'm talking, <laughs> you may not think that, but this conversation ultimately does become about that, that, that question when it plays out in electoral politics. 
I, I think it's a mistaken idea. I think um, Medicare has less government control than uh, traditional Medicare than, than anything else that you have going now because people get to choose private providers who are not controlled by the government. The government's role is merely to tax people and pay out money. Oh, no. No, and set I think, standards. Well, well <laughs> yes. I think Nancy Ann and I would agree that we sat in offices that controlled virtually every part of the system by virtue of those regulations right. and payment rules. And it's yeah. whoever pays controls. Hi, I have, a qu I have a question for you. Um, in terms of Trump has stated that he wants to work with um, drug companies to lower prices of pres uh, prescription medications. In a marketplace like we have in this type of scenario, how do you see that playing out? I mentioned just a minute ago that I saw most of these questions boiling down to a what, what, what role do you want the government to play? Um, while I was Secretary of Health, we were doing the prescription drug benefit, and there were a lot of people who said, we just need to turn the power of negotiating drug prices over to Medicare. Now, I, now I, I, I know what that plays out to mean. What it means is that the government gets to decide which drugs are available to people. In other words, the government, government's going to decide which ones are on the formulary. And the way these negotiations take place in countries where the government does is that they go to the drug manufacturer and they say, if you want your drug to be on the market, then you will give it to us at this price. Now, that's, that may appeal to a deal maker because they can leverage it. But if you're talking about the world of health where drugs have different effects on different people, and people may choose, then, then it, becomes a, so it becomes a question. How much control on health do you want the government to have? I can argue that both sides, but I think that is, the, in fact, the question. It's a really tough question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with respect to uh, health care innovation, are the insurance companies in an era of consolidation fit for purpose to do competition and innovation if we're coming down to just a handful of uh, organizations? Well, there's a big question about whether we are coming down. I mean, as you know, both of the two big, there have been a few smaller mergers, but the two big ones that are on the table have been rejected and are they're in court right now trying to preserve those mergers. So we'll see whether they go through or not. But um, you know, there's a sense in which in order to do what we asked them to do in the Affordable Care Act, they needed to uh, get bigger scale and they needed to be able to um, bring new skills to bear to manage care in a way that they had not before. So some of that actually uh, made some sense from the standpoint of trying to do a better job of of uh, you know providing the benefits, and we also put requirements on that they had to have a minimum uh, medical loss ratio. In essence, saying you have to spend a 80 cents of every premium dollar on actual health care. So that means they needed to tighten their belts and not spend so much on administration. So again, that leads to more scale. So a little bit like the other question, this is really hard. I could argue it either way. Um, I believe that we have laid a foundation. Um, not just really with insurance plans, but with uh, providers for uh, getting them to work more uh, collaboratively with each other, more team-based care, more um, you know, working towards an outcome, and that's been done through incentives in the law and some penalties in the law, and I think it's, it's working relatively well, and we probably should take another uh, run at the 2.0 version of that and see what we can do with it. We haven't had a chance in the short amount of time to talk about what may be the most profound change in health care since the widespread adoption of health insurance, and that's an, a change in the way health care is paid for. Uh, rather than paying for it on a fee for every item or every service, a lot of health care now is shifting toward a 
what's referred to as value-based care, where they're being paid for in part, at least, by the results that they produce. Now, that process of changing the way it's paid for is fundamentally changing the role of insurance companies, and it's beginning to blend the traditional tension that's existed between providers of care and payers of care because it brings them both together to say, we are incentivized to produce better health, not just more care. So the point I, I want to make with, in response to your question is, we're going to see, no matter what occurs, in the next five to 10 years, a dramatic change in the way healthcare is paid for, and it will demonstrate, it will bring along with it a blending of the roles of payers of care and providers of care. And I think uh, what we're seeing in this consolidation is the beginning stage of that on this 40-year journey we're on. Thank you. It's a great question, by the way. Hi, uh, I'm a sophomore in the college, and I just had a quick question about Medicaid. Um, block granting the Medicaid system has been an idea tossed around by a couple prominent Republicans. I think it was featured in Speaker Ryan's Better Way proposal. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, two-part question, the first being, do you see that as a serious possibility going forward? And the second part being, for states like Illinois that already really struggle to pay for Medicaid, do you have any fears about that leading to uh, a loss of benefits, especially for medically complex populations on Medicaid? Well, I have a short answer. I hope not. I hope we don't move towards block grants. Um, and yes, I do think that it, would, it could lead to uh, not enough money to care for people with medically complex conditions uh, because the governors would be forced probably, if you want to save money through block grants, you've got to cut the amount. Um, I know there's another argument and I'll let, I'll let uh, Governor Levitt make it. I don't actually know your opinion of this. But. Well, I, I have actually uh, been through this debate three times, uh, <laughs> twice as governor and once as secretary of health. And so I, I'm, I can give that block grant speech as well as anybody on the planet. Okay. Uh, governors just dream of the moment when they could just say, just leave the money on a stump in the woods for us and we'll, <laughs> we'll take care, we'll take care of, the, of everybody. But the reality is when you get down to the actual reality of this, it's a pretty frightening proposition for a state who has had the federal government as its partner so that when unemployment spikes and things turn bad, then you've got someone there with you. And the, 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 the trade-off is we will take a sum of money and give it to you. Well, what the federal government's in this for is because it gives them a limit to the amount they're spending and it makes their budget a lot easier. So I would suggest this likely won't happen because in the final analysis, states begin to figure out the reality of this. Block grants is one of those repair, repeal and replace phrases <laughs> that, that's used and by every, both parties have them. Universal yeah, care is another of them. But Here's the second reason I don't think it'll happen. The Republicans have a bit of a problem in that 16 or so states, big states, states that got Donald Trump elected president, expanded and have Republican governors. Now that's a tough one to say, hey, we're gonna take those away. I don't think he'll do that. Then you have a similar number of states who were good soldiers in the repeal and replace fight and didn't expand. So you're gonna tell them, so now we're here, you just don't get any of the money? We're just gonna give it to the people, who, that won't happen. So they're going to have to find a way to resolve this. And I believe the way they will resolve it is that they won't roll back Medicaid expansion the way we've, they'll, they'll make some changes, but it'll still be there allowing those big states to continue. And then they'll give the new states a lot of flexibility and they'll use the CMMI authority I talked about <laughs> earlier to give them all the authority they need. Now, they can't just expand it for everybody because they're also trying to do a trillion dollars worth of mm -hmm. infrastructure and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I believe what's gonna happen is that they will essentially reduce the overall, well, they'll keep the amount of money about the same, but they'll spread it over more states. They'll give more states access to that money by giving them more authority. So I could go into more detail, but I, I think the answer is no, and those are the two reasons I don't think they will, and, but I do think there will be changes. Thank you.
We're on our last questions here, so um, keep them on, short. In a recent um, committee hearing on repairing and, and uh, working over Obamacare, uh, one, of the, one of the witnesses was Governor Bashir of Kentucky, and he was basically the poster child of Obama really works. He said Kentucky was terrible, and we brought it in, and it was wonderful. And when asked about block grants, he said, oh, that's just the way for the government to say, you're going to be the bad guy who has to cut it. <laughs> so my question is, I was going to ask something on block grants too, but the question is, uh, but Governor Bashir was like the poster child for Obamacare. It worked wonderfully. It improved the health care of our state. We really needed it. It actually improved our economy. And so when asked, why did it work so well in Kentucky? But everybody else is saying Obamacare is a disaster. It's terrible. His answer was, well, because I wanted to make it work, and maybe those other governors didn't want to make it work. So could you each comment on that? Because you're saying everything is politics. So I'm just. I think that's true. And I think in Kentucky, um, there were, I had examples of people who didn't know that they were getting health care through the Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare. They thought they were going to the Kentucky Connect. And you know the state children's health insurance program, which we both worked on, was similar. When they thought it was the state program, they liked it better. So some of it was branding. California is another example of a state where they were all in, and it's worked very well there. They have healthy markets. And I would also suggest that things probably, I want to be clear, I don't think everything is politics. I think there's reality, and then there's <laughs> politics. And, and politics is, is part of reality that we have to, to, to deal with. But part of that political reality is things are probably not as good in Kentucky as the governor makes them sound, and they're probably not as bad as the other side makes it sound. And when you get down to reality, there are some problems, and they need to be, need to be fixed. Hi. Um, I'm a third year in the college, and I had a question, um, I guess, directed to both of you. Um, to what degree do you think uh, community rating has created distortions in the insurance market? And um, what role do you think community rating plays in repealing the place um, moving forward? Do we need to have a little definition of community okay, rating? Okay, I, I will. Community rating is when we decide we're going to allow healthy young people to pay more to make certain that it's affordable for less healthy older people. In other words, you're taking from one part of the pool to average it out and they call that community rating. And the dilemma here is that the law created a, a, a fence or, or a, a, a barrier. And they said, you can't charge more than $3 for a sick elderly person more than you would for a young healthy person. And so when you do that, it means that the cost for the young healthy person skyrockets. And that has created serious distortion. And it's one of the things that has to be fixed uh, in order for this fragile individual market. And so one of the things that's being proposed is that you just expand that to be five to one. Now, there's implications to that. It means that, yes, the young, healthy people get lower premiums, but it means that the less well, older people have their premiums go up. And so it becomes a matter of philosophy. What should our philosophy be about people paying their fair share and society's role? And so it comes back to what role should government play in our lives, uh, defining so much of this. Right. And how much are you willing to subsidize for the people who are, who are um, sicker? And I just to I quibble with one word, you said um, that it meant that the premiums for young people had skyrocketed. When you actually look at the numbers, yes, they're higher. For someone like you, if you had been paying for coverage, it might be 50% higher. But the, but the premium number itself would be quite low. Now, you wouldn't like paying 150 instead of 100. But when you look at a senior who might be paying you know, 500 or 600 versus 1,000, um, you know, to me, that seems fair. But this is a f philosophical difference. And, and, and oftentimes what the solution turns out to be is, well, let's not have either of them pay it. Compromise. We'll just have the government pay it. <laughs> and so a lot of these decisions are, should we have rate payers solve this problem, 
Or should we just let the taxpayers solve this? Somehow there's this amorphous thing out there that we don't have to really, and, and that's too often been the solution, and it's the reason we end up in these situations where we're, we have a big deficit. Thank you. Michael Massal, excellent presentation. I'm at the Kennedy Center, and I'm a physician. I'm very concerned about individuals with complex disability. There was never an insurance market for them. Let me be explicit. The insurance market never covered individuals who had Down syndrome, who had CP, who had autism, who had intellectual disability. And the worst situation in the world is to say, here's your adult Medicaid. Good luck on how you negotiate the adult health system. The assumption is made that either the elderly are disabled and there's this very small number of adults with complex conditions, but the key assumption is what percentage of adults are we talking about? And when, when we look at children's health and the complexity of whether it's the autism epidemic or the kids who survive leukemia or things like that, they're much more higher than the historical ratings work. And markets can work if I have a 90% market share. Markets have never been set up to cover 100% and all. And I was reminded of this, and this is my question, is that Paul Ryan said on CNN, we want the states to have this complex care, a, a state-run marketplace for those with disabilities, and he makes the assumption that it's 8% of the population. He has no idea of the basis of that, and it is so critically important to get that right. At the same time, if I just live in Trump what, land in fairy tales, I can't get the message out. How would you get the message out, and how would you make sure that all and choice and markets means all and choice and true markets? I kind of got the impression that was directed to me, so I'll, I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like, I think if we had the ability to poll the entire population of the United States and we were to ask them a couple of questions, do you believe everyone ought to have access to insurance? Almost every hand would go up. If you said, do you think the government ought to create a mechanism to assure that people with complex disabilities have insurance and the government ought to be involved in that, I believe you would get a profound response, yes, I really do. I think that, that, is, that is the American psyche to be in a place, it's our sense of compassion mm -hmm. and it's universal. Now, we said the government. Now we break into a new debate. Which government? And this is one that started in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention, where there were certain people who thought that a big national government was just the ticket. And then there are other people who said, look, we've just spent a revolution paying with our blood to get away from that, and we want to have the capacity of, a, of our local governments to do those things. And we ended up with a compromise called the United States of America. Now there's a lot of people, and I have to be one of them, happen to be one of them, who believe that the people in state legislatures passionately believe that those who have disabilities and are complex ought to be taken care of. Now there are people who don't believe you can count on states to do that. I'm not, I don't happen to be one of them. But I, I do think it's a logical place for government. The big debate will be which government. Thank you. Oh. Governor, if you, if you lived in Illinois right now, you might have less confidence that the state can, <laughs> can respond. You know, there's nothing more refreshing than getting a retired health reform czar and a retired politician together to talk candidly about, uh, about these issues. And more than that, uh, because I, have, I know them and uh, I suspect we'd get a candid conversation under any 
uh, circumstance. It is really, really refreshing to hear a uh, thoughtful discussion about a really complex and important issue um, in a respectful way. And one of the things that's absent from our politics too often today is that. And we're never going to solve our problems uh, if we can't restore that to our politics. So as much as you've uh, enlightened us, I so appreciate that you've uh, offered us light and not heat tonight. And for that, I want to give you a And then I want to thank Jackie for another excellent job of moderating. Um, we're not saying goodbye to you yet, right? You have no, one, not one... quite yet. OK. And I'll be back. Uh, but we've uh, loved having her here these two weeks. So give her a big hand. Thank well. you. And thank you for your, thank you as always for your excellent questions. Have a great night.